This week, we've put into Venice, on the Adriatic Sea, the great merchant city of the Renaissance. We've paid dockage, secured the ship, and made arrangements to take on provisions for the next leg of our journey. For now, the work is done, and so it's time to take a moment to relax and tell a few stories, to head down to the local inn and have a good meal, get something to drink, and perhaps light a pipe and listen to the tales of a hundred other voyages in a dozen different languages. We have a few stories to tell as well. We've been a lot of places and seen a lot of things. In the past two years, we've met a lot of people who have peered into the secrets of nature so that we could see them too. So, as we gather around the table, settle in, place your order, and let's tell a few tales from the Odyssey. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 3, Finding Our Place. Episode 19, All Ashore, The 100th Show. Welcome to our 100th show event. We've got a great hour or so of podcasting ahead, but I want to take a few minutes to reflect on where I've been and where we've been before I get to answering the questions you all have been kind enough to send me. The genesis for this thing started back in 2014. I'd been talking about putting together something out of my notes for a critical thinking colloquium that I teach on the history and philosophy of science at Gordon State College, and it was May on a cycling vacation across the state of Georgia that I began to put words to paper. There was a lot of uncertainty about what it would take, but I realized that if I didn't get to writing, it would just be a dream. Listening to Mike Duncan and Dan Carlin was a source of inspiration, but so were the conversations I had with my friends, colleagues, and coaches, Janetta Cravens, Marty Abbott, and Evan Butts. Over that summer, I worked on drafts and started trying to learn about what it would take to podcast. I got a few pieces of equipment and began making practice recordings and sharing them with a few friends to see what they thought. It was all pretty rough, and I am indebted to Robert Jordan for his honest constructive criticism of my early bumbling attempts to create something different. Then school started, and everything ended up on the back burner for a couple of months. I wanted to move forward, but I was plagued by doubts and questions, and so it just wasn't a priority to get a podcast out. Then. As I approached midterm, I realized that it was sort of now or never. If I didn't get something out there, I would just be a guy who had talked about having a podcast rather than being one who did. Again, some insightful words from Robert Jordan were helpful in this. I heard a phrase here recently from a different context that I wish someone had told me at the time because it perfectly encapsulates what I needed to hear then. It's better to be brave than perfect. Somehow, over the course of that fall break back in 2014, I mustered the courage to set aside all of my doubts and I recorded the first few episodes from the scripts I had written and published the first one on October 12th, the final day of that break. That first episode, setting out, was a bit rough, but when I listen to it now, I'm proud of it, even as I still wince at the production quality from time to time. So it's been two years and 98 episodes since then that has brought us to this point. We've gone from averaging about 100 downloads a week to over 2,000. I've written and recorded over 580,000 words and had over 80,000 total episodes downloaded. In that time, my life has been a bit of a roller coaster that included getting to spend a wonderful sabbatical year at Berry College with a group of fantastic colleagues devoted to teaching and research, and then getting run over by an 18-wheel truck while riding my bike. 
I've learned more than I ever thought I would while doing the research for these episodes, and my respect for the thinkers and scholars and all of the disciplines that we've covered has only grown. I've seen my original outline go from thinking that I'd be able to cover each major idea in 15 to 20 episodes to realizing that to do each one justice will take a year or more. The most rewarding thing, however, has been getting to meet some of you all who do me the honor of downloading this show and listening to me each week. I'm very much humbled that you would give me your precious time, and it's been great getting to know some of you just a bit. By the way, for those of you who haven't joined the conversation, either on Facebook or by following me on Twitter, I would really love for you to do that. At the end of this episode, I'd like to be a little bit more specific in my thanks, but I want to jump into your questions at this point. So for our first question, Emery Meltzer asks, What's my process of producing the podcast? So, how does the show get made? My original intention was to do the research for each series way in advance and then be able to focus on writing and doing supplemental reading. But you know what they say about the best laid plans? Pretty much, things are a bit hand to mouth when it comes to preparing for the podcast at any given time while school's in session. I try to stay about a week or so ahead in my research, which consists of doing a lot of reading and meshing that with the scientific understanding I already have. My sources usually consist of two or three good books, usually strongly biographical in nature, and then I supplement those through reading papers I find via blogs such as Wewell's Ghost. When possible, I try to tap folks that I know have been involved in the scholarly conversation in the history of a particular topic when I know who they are. In the week I'm going to record the podcast, I try to write about a thousand words a day. Depending on my grading and curricular development load there at my day job, sometimes that goal doesn't get met and so I'm scrambling a bit to get caught up on Saturday, sometimes even Sunday mornings a bit. The hardest thing is taking the time to edit. It's not that I mind hacking away at my own writing, in fact actually I think it's really a productive thing to do, but rather, given the other demands my life makes, I sometimes just don't have the time to do the work. If I have any sort of continuing regret about the podcast, that's probably it. I know that I could produce better content and more polished prose if I just had more time. If anyone out there would like to drop about a hundred grand a year to fund me, quitting my regular gig to focus on this thing, get a hold of me and we'll talk. All kidding aside, usually after I finish the writing, I head into the back room here at the Big Pink House, usually on Sunday morning, to get the show recorded. I use a basic but pretty serviceable microphone that I run through a little mixer into my Max USB port so that I can record in GarageBand. It usually takes me about two hours to record 45 minutes worth of material. Since everything I do is scripted, I use a teleprompter app on my iPad to keep me on task. One of the hardest things is reading the script and not sounding wooden something I think I only partially succeed at. To help with this, I try to read a piece or part of the script out loud once before I record it in order to get a sense of the flow of my own writing. Sometimes when I read a sentence out loud, I realize that it sounded very different in my head when I wrote it, and I have to sort of rethink the phrasing and improvise a little bit. For those who wonder, I make mistakes at about the same rate everyone else who uses this approach seems to, which is about once every couple of minutes. Fortunately, GarageBand makes it pretty easy to edit out the flub and pick up where I left off. I run two vocal tracks, one for narration and one for quotations, which each have slightly different effect settings to help distinguish the voice of each. I also run a music track where I place the pieces from the Blue Dot sessions that you get to hear. Once I get that finished, I run it through the processing part of GarageBand and then upload it to my Libsyn host server, which distributes the RSS feed to the various services that you all use to listen to the show. Getting all of that set up was a relatively painless process on the Libsyn side, and for those of you who are thinking about starting your own podcast, I would recommend you check them out to see if they can meet your needs. I guess that would be the last thing I might say in reference to Amory's question, and that has to do with the broader topic of podcasting itself. What I'd like to say here is if you've got an idea for a podcast, develop it and go. Now, I think there are a few caveats to be noted here when I say that. I regularly read the posts of the various Reddit subreddits related to podcasting, 
And I can pretty much tell you that if you're going to do the thing where you just sit around with a few of your friends and shoot the breeze, that market's pretty crowded and you're not likely to have much success in gaining an audience. In order to deal with that, you want to make sure that your podcast is about something and make sure that you're passionate about it. A lot of podcasts start strong and then fade once folks realize how much work goes into making a good podcast. For me, to create 45 minutes of reasonable content each week, it takes me about 10 to 15 hours of time. Also, if you're going to do a show on any entertainment topic, know that this is also a pretty saturated market and you'll really need to bring your A game to stand out. In both of these genres, there seems to be some kind of a misconception on the part of a lot of podcasters that you can just sit down, turn on the mic, and go. Good podcasts of this sort require a good bit of preparation. For those of you who are interested in doing podcasts in history, find a niche and then really dig into it. Do a really thorough and in-depth history of the region you live in, for example, or, or some topic that you just find really, really fascinating. Be sure to go well beyond what people can look up on Wikipedia or Google easily. Add value to the historical facts and make sure you get things right. One thing that I think is important is that you've got to get beyond the, the dates and events sort of approach and engage your listeners in a narrative. Tell stories. Uncover processes and societal forces. Explain what things are important in terms that a person can understand in relationship to his or her everyday life. The other thing that I would say to aspiring podcasters is to be consistent. I work pretty hard to release an episode every week and to do it on Sunday so that you know when to expect the episode. If you do a podcast, unless you're Dan Carlin, I think you need to try and do the same. Whether you release once a week, once every two weeks, or once a month, get a schedule and stick to it. Consistency will grow your show faster in terms of an audience than any other things, and a lack of that can really handicap you. As for audio slash production quality, you'll start off rough and then get better. Over time, you'll find your voice, which, by the way, will be different than anyone else's. Don't try to sound like somebody else in your podcast. Be yourself. That's okay. Really embrace your own voice. Underlying all of this, as I mentioned a few moments ago, is that you have to be passionate about the topic of your show. A good show takes a lot of time and effort, and if you're just doing a podcast to impress your friends or be cool, you'll pod fade in about six months. Okay, on to the next question, or in this case, questions. Listener and longtime supporter of the show, the Right Honorable Andrew Mintz, has asked two questions, actually. The first has to do with the atom, and the second has to do with where this whole universe thing comes from. Mr. Menz has a way of asking easy and simple to answer questions. By the way, a lot of us history podcasters owe Andrew a huge debt of gratitude. I don't think there's anyone on the planet, and I'm not exaggerating here, who knows more about history podcasts than Andrew does. Moreover, he's a consistent advocate and promoter of the smaller shows like this one. He's always encouraging in his comments and insightful in his discussions. My only complaint is that he's in Britain, and so it makes it really hard for me to thank him properly by buying him a drink every now and again. Okay, on to the first question. What's really going on with the atom, and why is all this quantum mechanics stuff so dang confusing? I get this sort of question a lot, and the answer is both simple and frustratingly complex. I think that when we think of the atom from the 19th century chemistry perspective, it's actually a pretty simple thing. It's a sphere. It interacts with other atoms according to discoverable patterns that allow for prediction. It's an easy to visualize model that corresponds to things we interact with on a daily basis. The result of this view is the development over time of things like synthetic products, such as new dyes, pure medicines, and in time, other substances built out of polymers and such. The problem with understanding what's going on with the atom really crop up when we try to push the understanding of the whys of the rules that we get when we work with that spherical model. Spheres don't just stick together. So when Thomson discovers the electron at the end of the 19th century, as part of that flurry of research and discoveries centered around investigating the Crookes tube, 
we finally begin to understand that the sphere has a more complicated structure that is both confounding and explanatory. One of the two major developments in modern physics, that, that thing that happens over the first 35 or so years of the 20th century, centers on trying to understand what's going on with the atom. And that process makes it pretty clear that what reality is and how we perceive that reality aren't really the same thing. And this is where we get into some of the more philosophical slash cognitive science things I discussed in our episodes on the brief history of telling time. Human beings are empirical creatures. We base our understanding of the world around us, at least initially, on our perceptions. The question is, do our senses actually represent that reality accurately? As a number of cognitive scientists and philosophers of mind have pointed out, there's no reason that they have to. What our senses have to do is allow our minds to construct a picture of reality that gives us a better chance of passing our genetic code on to our offspring. So the problem with understanding quantum mechanics, our first comprehensive description of the behavior of subatomic systems, lies in the fact that on the level of our senses, the world behaves according to a set of rules that we call classical and are pretty well understood by our perceptive apparatus. When we get down to the subatomic level, these rules don't seem to work. Unfortunately, our sense perceptions didn't evolve to interact with the subatomic world, and so our perceptive apparatus is very poorly equipped to access what's actually going on there. What we have to do is build models to try to understand what is actually taking place. These models, however, are always based on our classical framework. We tend to think of electrons, for example, as small balls whirling around in orbits around a compact collection of bigger small balls, for example. The problem is that there's no evidence that any of this model is true. As Heisenberg showed, all we can really do is work with abstract physical quantities, like energy and momentum, in very complex mathematical descriptions. While Schrodinger's wave functions initially held out the possibility that maybe we could shift over to thinking of electrons as something like balls riding on waves or whatnot, it turned out that while this mathematical description was appropriate, his physical interpretation of what the mathematics said was absolutely wrong. So, we really don't know what an electron is. We know that when we measure its properties, looking for particle-like characteristics, we find those. When we look for wave-like properties, we find those. But what should be understood is that the particleness and waviness are classical ideas based on our experience of playing with things like slinkies and baseballs. We don't actually know what an electron or any other subatomic particle is, to be completely honest. While we can calculate that an electron will interact with a photon, and we can determine the probabilities of how likely it will be that that photon will be absorbed by the electron, which will then transition to a higher energy level, we don't have a good physical description of what's going on in that process. While we can represent it mathematically using the tools of quantum field theory, no one can give a classical description of the process, something that our senses would understand. This is because reality at that level doesn't work in any way that makes sense for our senses. Those things that develop to understand the classical realms of things like baseballs and slinkies. One of the interesting areas of research in physics is trying to construct how that mathematically represented set of processes that occur on the subatomic level combine to form the classical behaviors we see on the macroscopic level. This leads into Andrew's second question about where do we think this whole universe thing came from. How do we get from, say, a supposed nothing to a universe full of matter and energy? And to be clear here, when we say nothing, we really mean nothing. Not only are we talking about a lack of matter and energy, we mean a complete lack of the framework in which those things exist, space and time, or in Einstein's formulation, space-time. The present outcome of the path of the various quantum field theories I've just mentioned is what we call the standard model of particle physics. Part of this model is an explanation of how matter of various forms get created out of energy and how that matter acquires specific properties such as mass. 
as a result of this, we can come up with an explanation of how the universe formed that is usually called the Big Bang Theory. As a side note here, almost every physicist and astronomer I know of hates that term for the scientific description of the evolution of the universe. Now, as I understand it, the term was first used derogatorily by the astronomer Fred Hoyle, who actually advocated a model of a steady-state universe rather than one that was expanding from an originating point as suggested by Edwin Hubble. Most of us in the disciplines associated with this prefer a name more along the lines of the expansionary model or the inflationary model of cosmogenesis, but Hoyle's term stuck in the popular imagination, and so we kind of have to work with it. Now, we'll eventually get to the discussion of the development of these models in our present series, but there has been a significant amount of observational evidence collected that supports the idea that the universe as we see it, including space-time, all matter, and whatever energy we see, as well as some we might not see, originated as a single event that started it all. What Andrew wants to know is where do the cosmologists think the initial energy and point of expansion came from? Well, again, and I hate to say this, to be honest, we really don't know. Part of the problem is that we think that the standard model of particle physics is incomplete, which means our understanding of physics is incomplete. The model works pretty well below certain energies, but that only gets us to a within a certain fraction of a second of the Big Bang event, as it were, taking place. Something like 10 to the minus 41 seconds, which is a really short time, but it's not back to zero. To understand things before that, we need to have the standard model fail at predicting something so we get a better idea of how to make modifications to the model. So. Anything we propose to explain what happens before this time is just a hypothesis and is actually, turns out, not a very testable one at this point. The most common hypothesis is that everything comes about as a quantum fluctuation combined with what is known as symmetry breaking that releases enough energy to drive everything outwards. Now, usually when you talk about quantum fluctuations of this sort, you're using the version of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle that says that the universe can create energy out of nothing for a very short period of time. Now I know that's weird, but it's true. It's one of those things that our classically biased brains struggle to understand. But we do see this when we look at vacuum conditions on short enough time scales and things like particle accelerators and nuclear reactors and scintillation counters. The problem with this explanation though, at least for me, is that prior to the initial event, there is no such thing as time, at least in how we conceive of it in general relativity. So how can we have a fluctuation in something that doesn't actually already exist? The idea, however, is consistent with data we've gathered about the distribution of matter in the early universe, and so it's the front runner at this point. It is a hypothesis, though, that I think we should hold very loosely. As we've seen several times in this podcast, Having the hypothesis gives us a way to move forward in our investigation, but I think there's a pretty good chance that this one could be wrong. The important thing is that it gives us a way to frame discussion and research, and so that's a really good thing. Also, I should say here, when I say I think that the hypothesis is wrong, I'm talking specifically about the quantum fluctuation part of that. We have tons of great evidence that supports an expansionary and an inflationary model of the universe. It's when we get down to that really that fraction of a second right after the formation of the universe that we're talking about here. What we really need to have happen here is to get the standard model to fail at one of the things it predicts. And that will lead us forward to give us a better idea. And that's the kind of research that's going on at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. Particle physicists are crashing protons and antiprotons together at very high energies to see if they produce exotic subatomic particles that the model doesn't predict, which would tell us that not only does the standard model have flaws, but it would also tell us where those flaws might be. It's a bit like that story we told back in the History of the Atoms section of the podcast about the Dirac equation failing to predict fine structure splitting in a large magnetic field. And that issue leading to um, sort of the fixing of renormalization in quantum field theory, which then gave us a way forward in developing models for the strong and weak interactions. Unfortunately, in a sense, 
The guys at CERN, every time they do their experiments, they get exactly what the standard model predicts. Hopefully, though, soon, we'll find a place where the standard model fails, and that'll move us forward. So there you have it. Quantum fluctuation combined with symmetry breaking is currently the most viable hypothesis for the formation of the universe. Oh, and don't worry, Andrew. The vicar never need be the wiser. Bill Jenneru asks, has your podcast had any influence on your other work? And the answer here is yes, absolutely. First, since I teach a course on the history and philosophy of science, the research I've done for the show really helps me enrich that course significantly. However, there's a much broader sense where it informs my general education physics courses. One of the things about my teaching pedagogy is that I'm pretty constructivist in my approach to developing curriculum. And so my students do a lot of their own scientific discovery in my classes. For example, I don't tell them what Newton's second law is. Instead, they take data and build models that eventually lead them to discovering it for themselves. As a result of my work for the podcast, I've changed how that guided inquiry takes place in that there's now a place in that activity where they have to confront the fact that the model they develop early on does not accurately predict the behavior of falling bodies. This then becomes a discussion of hypothesis modification and the use of thought experiments that allows them to suggest ways in which they can modify their original hypothesis, which can then be tested to show the importance of the Newtonian definition of inertial mass. Without the work on the podcast, I would never have made this or other similar changes in my gen ed courses. Finally, for me personally, I think that as a result of thinking about the philosophical issues with particle physics, I've become much more instrumentalist in my approach to science. I would still probably say that I'm a realist deep down, but I'm much more willing to accept the idea that any parts of a model or hypothesis that haven't been directly observed have to be, as I said in reference to the previous question, held loosely. I think a scientist makes more progress if he or she believes that they're trying to create real descriptions of a real world. But I've seen too many instances where clinging to those descriptions too strongly has become an impediment to forward progress. One example of a person who I think got this right was James Clerk Maxwell, who, in developing his electromagnetic theory, posited the existence of vortices in the fields to explain certain things using a very fluid-based model. Doing this helped him work through some difficult parts of the theory, but at some point he realized fields couldn't be thought of in that way, and so he dropped that particular part of the description. This shift towards instrumentalism has also helped me maintain a more skeptical attitude towards new scientific ideas as they come out. I don't have to commit to the idea's physical reality in order to weigh its explanatory merits. This helps me to keep a more open mind about new research and explanations. It also allowed me to remain sane as I was trying to work through all the stuff I was reading about whether time was a real thing or not. And I can't tell you how much that was really a struggle. Next, one listener asks about a couple of questions about arcane academic stuff. Why is it a doctor of philosophy when you don't actually have to take philosophy classes in grad school? And where do those goofy looking robes come from one sees at various academic functions? A quick note of apology here. For the life of me, I cannot find the email or message that contained the original questions, and so I don't know who sent it to me. To the listener who was kind enough to engage with this project, if you want to send me another note, I'll be sure to mention your name in the next episode. So first, you can almost always assume that when you run across some weird or strange thing in academia that doesn't seem to quite fit in our modern culture, it comes from somewhere a ways back in the nearly 1,000 hi year history of the university. That's the case with both of these. So let's take them in reverse order. The best way to think of the robes is to remember that the original universities in places like Paris, Oxford, Genoa, Padua, whatever, grew out of clerical education centers that were originally founded by Charlemagne. As these institutions began to diversify and gather scholars together, they took on a structure somewhat similar to guilds of the time, adopting the practice of wearing distinctive clothing of a particular guild. So, the usually black robes of the clergy were combined with the more colorful hoods you see in ceremonies today. 
The colors of the lining of the hoods designate the broad discipline area as well as the institution from which the degrees were granted. Also, the hoods and additional flourishes on the robes mark the rank of the wearer from student through bachelor to master. Moreover, with the lack of central heating and a lot of Northern Europe being really rather cold during the period of time when these universities really flourished, having heavy robes in the winter months was more than just a decorative accoutrement. It was necessary to stay warm in a room made of stone with only a small fireplace for warmth. As the institution of the university matured, it was recognized that some individuals in the theology faculty created a wholly new theological knowledge or church doctrine. Hence, they were called doctors. In the area of the arts, which is sort of short for the craft of learning or artisanship of philosophy, the person who created new knowledge outside of law, medicine, or theology was thought to be a doctor of philosophy. In this scheme, one should think of philosophy as encompassing everything from ethics to epistemology and thus natural philosophy as well. Thus, it was thought that the study of subjects such as mathematics, astronomy, and natural sciences, as we might now call them, fell under the broad purview of philosophy. It is only since the 17th century, the period that we've been most recently discussing in the podcast, that natural philosophy begins to emerge as its own thing with a unique process of inquiry. Nowadays, this distinction of those who do research and create new knowledge in the liberal arts are awarded a doctor of philosophy, something that is always a degree awarded for research. Other types of doctorates, such as a medical doctor, a jurist doctor, and a doctor of dentistry, for example, are degrees awarded for the mastery of a practice of a profession. Hopefully, this clarifies some of the arcane practice and nomenclature of higher education. Listener Adam Frank has asked me a couple of questions. The first has to do with evidence for human beings causing climate change. To a degree, I'm going to have to pass on this question. It's not that I think it's a bad question, quite the contrary, actually. It's that I lack the expertise to comment in more than a general way, as I have no academic training in climate science or meteorology. But I will tell you what I know. Here's what we understand. Climate change is taking place, and that isn't just an observed fact. We see this in so many different observations, from global oceanic heat content and atmospheric temperatures the migration patterns of birds, that the only thing anyone is arguing about at this point is how much of this global warming, as it were, is taking place. The real scientific question at this point is, what is the role of human activity, specifically human industrial activity, in causing that change? What we know is that there are a number of measurements, things like atmospheric carbon dioxide levels, that correlate very well with increased temperatures. However, as many no doubt are thinking as I make this point, correlation is not causation. This is where you get to using the ideas of abductive reasoning and inference from best explanation that we talked about way back in some of the early episodes of the podcast. There are other possible reasons for observed climate change. For example, we know that the amount of energy put out by the sun changes over time by a very small amount. In fact, the 22-year sunspot cycle is strongly correlated with the drought and flood cycles in the Midwest and Great Plains of the United States, for example. Could it be that our warming atmosphere is due more to energy being given off by the sun than it is due to human industrial activity? And this is where I reach the end of my level of expertise. So what I'm going to say here really is just coming from people in the research field. As I understand it, climate scientists, men and women who have spent their lives working on and researching the Earth's climate and atmosphere, have ruled this and all other possible explanations out. In fact, as I understand it, what they've done is ruled out any other proposed explanation beyond that of human industrial activity to the point where over 98% of those engaged in the research have become convinced of a causal link. To get an understanding of this, let's break it down using a different example. Let's say that you know that over the last century, there's been an increasing incidence of lung cancer. Now, let's also say that when you poll all oncologists, physicians who specialize in the study of cancers and what caused them, they tell you that there's a 99.9% .9 chance that the cause 
of the increasing incidence of lung cancers is cigarette smoking. How would you receive that news? Now let's say there are a few others, not oncologists, sometimes not even medical doctors, that dispute this finding. They say that it's possible that the medical condition might instead be caused by driving, maybe. They claim that the evidence the oncologists are presenting can only support the conclusion of correlation but not causation. So who are you going to believe? I don't think you have to have a detailed understanding of the processes of cancer formation in the human body to think that if, say, 99% of the oncologists that study the stuff are saying that smoking cigarettes causes lung cancer, that you would decide that you probably shouldn't pick up the habit. More than that, though, you might, on a public policy level, enact restrictions on cigarette smoking for the public good. This is where the climate change scientific conversation is at right now. I don't know exactly why almost all of the climate scientists in the world say that human industrial activity is causing the atmosphere and the oceans to warm up, but I trust their ex collective expertise. Yes, there are a few who disagree, and some loud voices from outside the scientific community who seem to want to shout the vast majority down also exist. But this was also the case in the very real cigarette smoking example. And yet, here we are today with nearly every public institution restricting cigarette smoking to private settings. And no, there is no global conspiracy among scientists to delude humanity or the industrialized world. If that were the case, you'd see a lot more really, really wealthy scientists. Actually, don't even get me started on the whole giant, secret, scientific conspiracy thing. That would take me an entire episode just to debunk that bag of silly, and there are already a number of good podcasts which have done that well. Adam's second question is something that's a good bit more personal, but relevant enough, I think, to share with you all. Adam asks about my religious perspective. Do I believe in a God? And if so, what are the details of that, and how did I come to my faith? I said in the first episode that you should know about me as the navigator of the podcast and whether you could trust my guidance on the journey. This question fairly touches on that. However, my response will be intentionally vague for reasons I'll make clear in a moment. So here it goes. I identify as a Christian of the progressive persuasion. I confess the Nicene Creed and I try, and often fail, to live by the word of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. I am fairly familiar with Christian scripture and the writings of the early church fathers, but I've never studied systematic theology in any formal way, though my wife occasionally points out that the number of books on my shelves related to my faith rivals the number related to the history and philosophy of science and the study of physics and astronomy. I am in no way a fundamentalist or an evangelical, though my journey of faith has taken me through those places. I view my faith as something I try to keep somewhat private, as I think that's what Jesus tells me to do when he says that I should go into my closet and pray. In his question on the matter, Adam wonders what my reasoning or rationale is for my faith, and I can't say that I've arrived at it through a rigorous, evidence-based process. As I've said in previous episodes of the show, while scientific inquiry is a powerful way to understand the natural world, I don't find that it is an appropriate way to address all of the questions related to the human experience. In my striving to put some of the things in my life into some sort of perspective, I found my way to Christianity and was captivated by the words of Jesus of Nazareth. For me, the ethic of love that permeates all of his instruction is a profound way of understanding much of what I encounter in my interactions with both other people and my inner self. Do I recognize that this is a subjective experience? Yes, of course I do. Do I expect other people to take my word for it? Not at all. Do I realize that Christianity has perpetuated all sorts of non-loving things in this world? Absolutely. Nevertheless, I find that my faith offers me a path forward that is winsome and lovely when I'm able to strip away my own ego and vanity. So does my faith impact how I treat the church and the podcast? Yes and no. While I don't try to force science into some sort of theistic framework, as that would be outside of what scientific inquiry is all about, I do recognize the role matters of faith and religion have had in the lives of many of those doing science that we're discussing. Additionally, theological discourse has often intruded into scientific dialogue, usually to the detriment of both si the science being done 
and the religious institutions butting in. In light of this, I try very hard to be as honest about the role of religion in culture and the interaction between faith and science as I can. A lot of the supposed enmity between the two was manufactured during the Enlightenment and in the years afterwards. Modern scholarship has revealed that in many cases, religious institutions have actually done a lot to foster understanding of the natural world, often when secular institutions were either hostile or at least indifferent to such activities. However, there have also been times when religious institutions have made tragic choices when it comes to science and its practitioners, and as we will see when we get to the trial of Galileo, I have no intention of letting them off the hook on this matter. I hope in my answers to Adam's questions, I haven't offended any of you. If so, I ask for your forgiveness. The Odyssey is intended to be a place where any who wish to inquire are welcome. There's always room on board for anyone who wants to join in exploring the natural world. Listener Micah has two questions. The first is about something called the analemma. An analemma is created when you use a gnomon, you know, kind of a stick stuck vertically in the ground, and mark the point where the end of the shadow cast by that upright stick or pole is actually at. Now, due to the Earth's orbital dynamics, this point isn't always due south in the northern hemisphere at noon but rather it varies to the east or west a couple of degrees through the year. And as the days get longer and shorter, that point gets further away or closer to the pole itself. As such, if you mark the noon position of the shadow, say, every two weeks, you'll find that a lopsided figure eight is made. With the advent of photography, you can do the same thing by taking photographs of the position of the sun in the sky at noon from the same place every couple of weeks, and you'll see the same kind of figure. What Micah wants to know is when were the first analemmas produced? From what I've been able to determine, the discovery of the analemma really requires more than just a gnomon. What seems to be the case is that what is really required is a fully functioning sundial kind of thing, and so the early references we have to them being compiled dates to the period of the late Roman Republic. Vitruvius writes about them in the 1st century BCE, and they are part of Ptolemy's work known as the Tetrabiblios in the 2nd century CE. Analemmas may be older than that, but we don't have a written record of them prior to those dates. We'll post some pictures of what an analemma looks like on our website, thescientificodyssey.typepad.com, for those of you who haven't actually seen them before. Micah's second question has to do with my other great hobby, cycling. He wants to know what's the longest distance I've ever ridden in a single day. Well, about 15 years ago, I decided to try to ride a double century, which is about 200 miles from my hometown here in Georgia to the hometown of my in-laws in LA, that is, Lower Alabama. And unlike when most people do this, I decided to do it completely solo. Now the trip was undertaken before there was easily accessed GPS or even good cell phone coverage here in rural Georgia, and so I was working off mostly accurate maps to wind my way through rural Georgia, trying to avoid heavily trafficked highways and dirt roads alike. It was quite a trip that included running out of food and water, only to be rescued by coming across an inexplicably placed do-it-yourself car wash on the road between Cuthbert and Fort Gaines, Georgia. After a little over 11 hours and 206 miles, I arrived at my destination safely, only to find that my body no longer had the energy to regulate its own internal temperature without vigorous exercise. It took a very hot and very long bath and a lot of recovery beverage to stop shivering. Since then, my longest rides are usually limited to 125 miles, as I've been racing and the training for that requires shorter but more intense efforts, at least on the amateur level. However, as I work towards retiring from racing, I'll likely shift over to a discipline or a, a practice in cycling known as randoneering, a form of long distance cycling which will see me again riding longer distances. One final question here that I get asked by a lot of people. What do I listen to when I listen to podcasts? For me, podcast listening breaks down into three very broad areas, history, science, and then a combination sort of a faith and philosophy. In the first arena, I really recommend the following shows. Mike Duncan's History of Rome and Revolutions. Both are truly outstanding, especially when Mike steps back a bit from the narrative to provide analysis. I'm just not sure anyone's any better at that. 
Dan Carlin's Hardcore History is, of course, the gold standard in history podcasting for many, and I can say that I think his Ghost of the Ostfront series is the most powerful piece of podcasting I've ever heard, with his series on the Great War coming in a close second. Now, I actually found podcasting through a BBC4 series called The History of the World in 100 Objects, and I highly recommend that. It's just fantastic for getting a sense of world history beyond that of just Western civilization. I also very much like the biographically focused Giants of History podcast and the music history podcast titled Between the Liner Notes. In science, I recommend Rand Levy's Curious Minds podcast as well as the Freakonomics podcast. Undark is a good podcast covering issues within science journalism and communication. Science Versus is a good introduction to some of the controversies in science. And the Infinite Monkey Cage is always amusing and informative. In the area of faith, I listen to Rob Bell's Robcast somewhat regularly, but I really miss the Emergent Podcast. I wish somebody would come together to resurrect that thing. I'm really sad that it seems to have pod faded. In philosophy, I like Stephen West's Philosophize This and Peter Adamson's History of Philosophy Without Any Gaps. I'm also a regular listener to the Spokesman Cycling Roundtable podcast and will enjoy ESPN's Around the Horn and Pardon the Interruption when I'm off on a training ride and I need to pass the miles with some good-natured banter. Lately, I've been listening to another show when I can squeeze it in on the recommendation of Andrew Metz, BBC Four's In Our Time. The topics range all over the place, but I find the conversation between the various experts and whatever subject being discussed fascinating. Having said all of this, I really want to say also that there are some amazing podcasts that I just don't have the time to listen to. For me, it really is more a matter of time rather than one of interest. It turns out that one of the best ways to not have time to listen to podcasts is to start one of your own. Chris Stewart's The History of China is excellent, as is Daniele Bolelli's History on Fire. If you want to know more about history podcasts, there's a Facebook page titled History Podcasters that maintains a list of active history podcasts that you can take a look at. You can ask a question on that forum, and any number of my fellow history podcasters will be glad to help you. Similarly, there is a subreddit devoted to history podcasts for those who might visit the self-proclaimed front page of the internet from time to time. So, as we bring this celebration to a conclusion, I want to offer some thanks. First, I want to thank my wife, Kathy, who has unfailingly encouraged me all along the way. She has been more than patient and generous over the last two years in allowing me the time and space to read and write and blather on into a microphone as I do. Second, I would like to say thanks to all of my colleagues who have helped me in my research and crafting of the narrative. To Eric Sherry, Gary Cox, Todd Timberlake, Evan Butts, and Tony Christie, thank you for your comments, help, and insights. The podcast is better because of your willingness to answer my questions and offer your expertise and assistance. Thanks also to Gordon State College and Barry College, who have been kind enough to afford me a paying job so that I could pursue this hobby. A shout out as well to the Blue Dot Sessions for letting me feature your compositions on the show. Finally, Thanks to you, my listeners, especially Tom Heller, Tom Sweeney, Kevin Norman, Marty Abbott, Andrew, and Bill, who have served as a bit of a focus group in checking how the show is going from time to time. Our crew has slowly grown over the last two years, and we now regularly number over 500. As I said in the introduction, I'm truly humbled that all of you give me 45 minutes or so each week so that I can talk about this really niche thing. I hope that you're getting something of value each week out of the show. And if you ever have any comments or concerns, shoot me a note. I'm happy to hear them. Next week, we'll return to our exploration of the history and cosmology by diving into the tumultuous and noble life of Johannes Kepler. Until then, full sails on your journey.